evening, everyone. I want to thank you for coming out this evening. My name is Joanne Fairley. I am the chair of the Yukon Development Corporation, and I am speaking this evening on behalf of Minister Cathers, the minister responsible for the Yukon Development Corporation and the Yukon Energy Corporation. Unfortunately, Minister Cathers had a conflicting engagement and could not be here this evening. Yukon Development Corporation's mission is to create an environment that facilitates opportunities in sustainable economic development in Yukon through the provision of a safe, reliable, and cost-effective supply of energy and energy-related infrastructure that meets the needs of Yukon now and in the future. Working towards that mission, Yukon Development Corporation is currently implementing the Next Generation Hydro Planning Directive and is working with Yukon Energy to advance the rebuilding and upgrading of the Stuart Takino transmission line. According to the Yukon Electricity Forecast completed for the Next Generation Hydro Project, 50 years from now, Yukoners will consume two-thirds more electricity than today. This will require a 62% increase in electrical generation on the grid. As it can take 10 to 15 years to develop a hydro project, we must begin this work today in order to meet longer-term electrical needs. In the short term, Yukon's two utilities, Yukon Energy Corporation and ATCO Electric Yukon, will continue to plan for the near future. Much has already been accomplished since the Yukon Development Corporation tabled its next generation hydro work plan in May 2014. Our technical team has now completed and made public three technical reports providing the framework for further investigation, including an electricity forecast and a short list of potential projects. Our engagement team is working to ensure this project is as transparent and informative as possible through technical workshops and community meetings. The project team has visited First Nations and communities with lands potentially affected by the project not yet eliminated. Information and feedback collected during these meetings will be incorporated into the Next Generation Hydro discussion paper. Future investigations will assess each potential pro project to see if it meets future needs and if there is a way to mitigate environmental and socioeconomic impacts and First Nation concerns. I would like to emphasize that no site has been selected to date and much more work is required before a recommendation can be made. Next Generation Hydro is not only about addressing Yukon's future energy needs, it is also an opportunity to partner with First Nations on one or more projects that will create, create renewable energy for Yukon's future. Next Generation Hydro may also offer investment and partnership opportunities for First Nations. What those opportunities have looked like in other jurisdictions and how Yukon Development Corporation can foster similar opportunities with Yukon First Nations is one of the goals for the First Nations Energy Forum. The speakers you're about to hear this evening are in Whitehorse to share their experiences and knowledge as part of a broader First Nations Energy Forum being jointly hosted by the Council of Yukon First Nations and the Yukon Development Corporation. I hope you find the panel presentation engaging. We certainly did today. I look forward to the discussion this evening. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. I'm Dariel Tallarico. I'm with uh, Tipping Point Strategies, and uh, I know most of you have been to events already, but I'll just uh, re introduce myself again. Uh, we have the contract with Yukon Development Corporation to lead the public engagement for the Next Generation Hydro Project. Uh, so what we are going to do tonight is, I think we have um, until 9 o'clock, so we have time for lots of questions and uh, time for you to interact with the panel. What we were hoping for is, as with the other events that we've done for the Next Generation Hydro Project, is to share some of the, um, what we heard today and what our speakers have come from 
across Canada and even, I guess, Costa Rica, I understand. <laughs> Today, uh, one of our speakers came that far to be with us, and uh, we're very thankful for that. Uh, so we heard lots of uh, engaging stories today about partnerships and um, energy problems, energy solutions, and financial, uh, different ways of financing and uh, making projects happen. Uh, I just repeat, um, at these events we videotape them and so that we can put them up on our website so others that aren't able to come tonight can get to also hear the speakers. But what we do is we don't uh, videotape you asking questions. Uh, I think the way it works is we just video uh, record the what the speakers say. So uh, I think what we'll do is how we're going to start it is each of the speakers are going to just give you a little five five ten minutes about who they are, um, a little snapshot of what they said today, and then we're going to open it up to I'll start with some questions and then we'll get get a bit of a discussion going. So who wants to start? Okay, so Tracy, I've got to put my glasses on. Tracy Pascal is a member of the Pasqua yep. First Nation in Southern Saskatchewan and has been working at the First Nations Power Authority, which is actually a society, since May 2013. With a background in communications and Aboriginal affairs, she brings a broad range of experiences and perspectives to the discussion of First Nation energy partnerships. So Tracy, I'll let you start. Uh, Tense, thank you for coming here tonight to, uh, to join in the conversation about uh, energy and where the Yukon uh, government and Yukon Development Corporation and the uh, Yukon First Nations are gonna hopefully head towards the direction of uh, powering their own future. Um, I'm here to tell you a bit about FNPA. We are a non-for-profit organization headquartered out of Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, we have two types of memberships. One is for our industry members, which is the power industry, um, and the other one is for our general members, which includes First Nation communities, um, ECDEV corps, and tribal councils. Um, FMPA was created out of a growing interest, um, not only from First Nations communities, but the government itself, uh, Sask Power, who is uh, our Crown Corporation, and they are legislative to deliver power in our province. Um, so there was a need to generate um, an organization to facilitate the First Nations-led uh, development of power projects in the province. Um, so FMPA's role is to ensure a full disclosure to the Aboriginal community um, on the project development process, requirements, timelines, and investment requirements. We offer the community a, a transparent, um, uh, I guess, a vehicle. Uh, we ensure that um, they understand um, what's entailed when it comes to uh, engaging into a power project, and uh, we ensure that the, the lines of uh, communication are fulfilled and transparent. Uh, we currently have a couple of solar projects right now that we're working on. Um, one is uh, in northern Saskatchewan, actually both of them are, uh, for Fond du Lac First Nation and Hatchet Lake First Nation. Um, so we've put uh, solar panels on the roofs of the schools there to offset the power consumption and reduce uh, utility costs. Um, those two projects will be completed by August. Um, so we're hoping that in the next year or so we'll collect the data on that, share it with industry, our members, and uh, as well as SAS Power to show them that um, that solar energy does work in our province. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. So Jason will go next. And Jason Kalla is with Temex Planning. That's right, yeah. 
and First Nation Financial Management Board. Jason is a proud member of the Squamish First Nation and has 15 year experience providing technical support to First Nations at the local, regional, and national level. Jason holds a master's in urban planning and regional studies from London School of Economics and Political Science. His experience includes planning, research, and policy development, community planning, economic analysis, and financial advising to First Nations. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the Yukon First Nations for inviting us to their territory to share a few words tonight. Um, I do some work for the First Nations Financial Management Board, which is what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tonight. Uh, the FMB is a, is a First Nation institution. Uh, it was established with two other institutions, the First Nations Finance Authority and the First Nation Tax Commission. And it was established through federal legislation in 2005. The act is called the First Nation Fiscal Management Act. It's, uh, it's not a very sexy title, but um, it's, it's an important, I think, law that has uh, had some good, uh, good things happen over the last few years. So the idea of the act is really to, it's, it's threefold. It's to strengthen First Nation taxation systems, it's to improve accountability and financial management, and it's to improve access to capital for participating First Nations. So it's an optional initiative for First Nations that decide to participate. They can be added to the schedule. And I think the reason why it's relevant uh, probably to some of the energy projects is that First Nations throughout the country are looking at various projects throughout their territories and looking at participating in them. And so the idea is that they can participate in the projects and use the revenues that they generate from the projects um, to, to really leverage those revenues to put community infrastructure in place. So that could be roads, water, sewer on, on their, in their communities. Uh, it could be economic development projects. It could be community facilities like this beautiful facility we're in today. So the, uh, there's about 147 communities that are currently participating in the initiative. Um, there's about 100 of those that are working with the Financial Management Board. And the role really of the Financial Management Board is to certify the financial uh, system of the First Nation. So if the First Nation was to generate some revenue from whatever project, it could be a a, a co commercial development, a retail development, it could be a, a resource development, an energy project in their territory. Uh, they may generate some, some revenue. The FMB's job is to look at the financial system and to look at whether the standards that they have set are met. So for example, is there roles and responsibilities assigned to council, to the audit committee? Uh, is there uh, systems in place for multi-year financial plans, for budgeting? for uh, reporting uh, on the budget and the finances to membership and on capital project planning. So these are the standards that have been set that are really based on internationally recognized models. So that if, they are, if that's, that those standards are met, then a certificate can be issued to the First Nation who can then go on to the First Nation Finance Authority to try and, and access a loan through that, that organization. So the, the idea, too, is, is not just a single First Nation going by themselves. It's a cooperative initiative whereby a number of participating First Nations will, will put their loans into the First Nation Finance Authority. The Finance Authority will aggregate those borrowing requests. And once a sufficient amount of borrowing requests is received, the Finance Authority goes to capital markets and issues a debenture. And the advantage of that is uh, the diversified risk of the borrowing pool and the, the, the oversight of the Financial Management Board enables First Nations to achieve more favorable borrowing terms such that they could uh, improve their ability to, to act on projects. So I th I, it's been an interesting day, I know, talking today about the various energy projects and, and the hydro projects, and it's interesting, I was mentioning earlier today that when the legislation was developed, uh, really people were thinking it was gonna be the urban bands that had commercial development that would be utilizing the act, but it's really turning out to be a lot of bands that are in, in more rural, remote locations that are involved in resource projects that are finding different and unique ways to use the tool. So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see if the Yukon First Nations can find a way to use these kind of tools in ways we haven't even thought of yet. Thank you. Next, we have Mark Moran. He's with Peck Group. 
Mark is a general manager and president of Peck Group, a renewable energy developer with 100% ownership in, how do you say your first nation? Pequagami Nuwats, if we can. Okay, a Quebec <laughs> first nation. You should see how it's spelled. <laughs> he is a senior civil engineer from Quebec with over 20 years experience in hydroelectric projects and other water work engineering across the globe. And I take it uh, of late you're in, uh, in Costa Rica, based out of there. Mm -hmm. His experience is in different cultural and renewable energy market environments with private and community developers. This gives him a unique uh, perspective on renewable energy development uh, avenues and challenges. Mark? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share some of the experiences that we uh, come up with over the years. Um, like mentioned, uh, quite a few years into the making of different projects in different areas. Uh, and more recently, with uh, the PEC Group, which is 100% owned by a First Nation in Quebec, um, in partnership with municipalities, which are kind of innovative a little bit. Uh, we did uh, different, we have actually two projects, one on, on, on the construction starting this, uh, this fall, construction starting this fall, the other one is in operation since February. Um, so the idea here was to come and share basically the, 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 this, this, the experience of this partnership between uh, First Nations and municipalities and the structuring, how you structure the, the, the company who's doing it, uh, how it's been developed. And uh, so that's basically what we, we brought here and expose people to. Also some characteristic of the financing we have in particular in Quebec uh, for municipalities, for, for example, and also for the First Nation with uh, a, sp a specific uh, elements or group from the, the government uh, in Quebec. Uh, this is, uh, that was really to give a, per a perspective of a uh, different type of partnership that are possible. Thank you. And our, our last speaker here is Byron Leclerc with Pick River First Nation. Byron is the director of energy projects for Pick River First Nation with over 20 years experience. Uh, Byron serves as a president for the Cagiano, Cagiano Power Corporation, a wholly owned community energy project. And he's vice president of the business development for Victagon. Victagon Power Corporation, a partnership between Pick River and Interjex Renewable Energy. A staunch advocate of Aboriginal rights, Brian Leclerc has spoken at many conferences on topics related to Aboriginal people resource development projects, and benefits of First Nation business partnerships. He is a member as well of Pick River First Nation. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the invitation to come and speak and share our experience with the uh, Yukon First Nations, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, independent power production, the development of hydroelectric facilities, uh, and other renewable uh, projects. Uh, I'm actually closer to 30 years of experience now than I am 20, so it seems just like yesterday uh, we were invited by the province of Ontario uh, to review proposals that would look at the development of a 13 and a half megawatt hydroelectric project just three miles east of our reserve. Uh, and I remember that day vividly in which our chief said to, uh, to, the, to Ontario that we would not be part of an evaluation process that we would actually develop um, uh, that potential. Uh, and in 1987, we competed for and were successful in receiving the rights to develop uh, the Black River hydroelectric facility. And at that time, people had said, it can't be done. First Nations cannot own um, uh, these types of projects um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, there were legal reasons or real legal reasons in terms of whether First Nations were actual legal entities that could own property, that could sue or be sued, raise finance very technical reasons that, that we had to overcome. Secondly, uh, we were an anomaly. It had never been done in Ontario in which a First Nation was actually leading the development of, of, of hydro projects um, uh, for the province. Um, and uh, we competed for a project uh, in a territory that we claim as our own. And I always find that ironic. None of the projects that we've developed uh, since 1987 uh, have been given to us. We've actually had to go out and compete with 
non-native developers uh, for, each, uh, for rights to develop each of the projects, to develop them ourselves, construct and now operate and manage uh, those facilities. So what began in 1987 as a fairly simple $50,000 bet, I remember going to council and asking for that amount of money to embark upon a journey that would move us from an emphasis on, on job creation into one of wealth creation um, has turned out uh, quite well for, for Pick River. Today, we have three operating hydroelectric facilities. We produce about 45 megawatts. Uh, we have 45 megawatts of installed capacity. Uh, our company has $130 million in assets. We have another $500 million worth of generating projects under development um, uh, in Ontario, uh, encompassing wind, solar, uh, and additional hydro. And being on the leading edge of, of, of Aboriginal development in Ontario, we've always pushed the envelope and we're looking at developing new energy potential, new re renewable energy potential in jurisdictions that people aren't accustomed to here. Uh, for example, Puckasa National Park, which borders our First Nation, uh, we're looking at developing and we've submitted proposals to develop hydroelectric potential right within a national park. We believe that uh, our decision to develop the resources within our territory is consistent with a global concern with respect to climate change. We can continue to pretend that climate change in our own microcosms does not exist and we can continue to turn on the lights and rely upon fossil fuels to provide the electricity um, uh, that lights our lights, that heats our homes, uh, or we can take a proactive approach and reduce our reliance on, on fossil fuels. And in that regard, I think that the alignment of developing potential within a national park is not at all inconsistent with the priorities for uh, our First Nation. So it was interesting because our conversation today uh, uh, with the communities uh, uh, of the Yukon is a conversation uh, that we had 30 years ago and how the Yukon, uh, where the Yukon ends up in the next 30 years, I think they can look to other jurisdictions to see how governments have procured new power, governments have established targets for renewable power uh, um, as part of a, 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 a portfolio uh, and have implemented uh, RFP standard offer programs to support uh, new renewable energy. Uh, in particular, of, of concern to me is what those jurisdictions have done to support the investment uh, of First Nations uh, as owners of, of, of these projects. Uh, hydro projects are ideal mechanisms for, for, for communities like Pick River. They're long-term, they're non-governmental sources of revenue, they generate own source revenue in which the community itself sets its priority uh, for what it does with the money. Investment in education, community infrastructure, housing, these are all important components. Uh, I'm mindful of a, you know, I, I tell a story about um, the difference between living on reserve in Ontario and living off reserve. In Ontario, uh, we have transfer payments that, that fund, for example, elementary school. And, and every year, uh, the federal government gives to the First Nation $5,000 per student going to the Pick River Elementary School. The same children going to the school in Marathon, Ontario, which is 20 kilometers away, are funded at a level of $15,000 per year. And of course, you know, me being the cynic, I take, there's only two possible messages. Either our kids are worth a third of what the kids in Marathon are worth, or we we're three times the financial managers uh, that they are in Marathon. <laughs> but I only tell that story um, as, as, as uh, to, to put you in our mindset in terms of why we're involved in these types of projects. Why is a community like a First Nation interested in developing renewable energy uh, uh, potential within its traditional territory. It's to make up for that gap in funding, to maintain uh, our, our, our schools, to maintain our communities, uh, and to provide growth for, for the future. So it was uh, an opportunity that we appreciated to share our experience. Uh, for any of the listeners that are out there today, uh, our website is pickriverenergy.com. You can, you can see our entire story. It's, 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 it's available for the public. And then it's, it's an experience that we've become accustomed to share with other First Nations uh, across, across the nation um, and a story that we hope that uh, 
uh, that others can replicate. Thank you. So in the Yukon, we're very different um, jurisdiction, both in you know, size of population and uh, also our electrical infrastructure compared to where our speakers come from. So that's the first thing we know when we listen to their stories and we, we heard today. They live in a very different context than us. Um, but we also are a different context as well because we have uh, 11 out of 14 First Nations that are self-governing, which is a high percentage for a jurisdiction, higher than anywhere else in uh, the provinces. And in that spirit, uh, the directive, the Next Generation Hydro Directive does say, you know, that First Nations are to be partners in a future hydro project with support of renewables. So, so we kind of have this, this context where uh, how do we learn from what we are hearing from our speakers, and they'll get into more details on that, of the various different projects that they've been involved in, and the very innovative ways that they've funded those projects, uh, got their own First Nations to support them, and even the communities around them to be part of it, in, in the case like Mark is explaining, where a municipality is a partner with a First Nation. So we learned a lot about that today that was interesting, but I just want to put it a little bit in uh, context as well, that what you're going to hear from them is they're speaking a lot about a jurisdiction, like a provincial jurisdiction where the province knows that they have an energy gap coming, they know what that size of gap is, and they, they actually put out a call for um, looking for solutions, like is there other, who wants to help us fill that gap? through their uh, basically what we call the IPP policy or independent power producer policy. Versions of it, very different in each of the provincial jurisdictions, they're not the same. They have very different policy frameworks, but that's the concept. Uh, what I found interesting today was when that call goes out, are they gonna sit back and let an industry partner like a big development company go in and build it? Or were they gonna step up and do it themselves. And so we heard a little bit about that today. Do we take charge of our own future or do we let uh, industry partners come in and, take, and do it? And when industry partners come in, and we'll, we'll get into this in a bit to do the comparison of you know, what is the return to the community? What is the relationship like? What is the, the process like? And what is the return to the community if an industry partner, if an industry does it versus a First Nation leading? So I thought that was, that was interesting today. Um, also the motivation of climate change and the concept of, uh, in the provincial jurisdictions, of getting off fossil fuels. In the Yukon, at least for electricity so far, we're, we're blessed on grid only to uh, have most of our needs, like whatever it is these days, 98% uh, met through hydropower. But what, what we're looking at now, we're at the very, very early days, this is what this conversation is, of looking out into the future to say 20 to 50 years out, what we're gonna run out of that hydropower uh, that we have, how are we going to, uh, what are we gonna replace that with? What renewable energy source are we gonna replace that with? So I think that lays a bit of the context. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is really, this is the hard conversation ahead of us, is that um, we're also isolated grid up here. We can't buy and sell from other jurisdictions. They're all interconnected in these other jurisdictions. They, they have trade going between provinces and different regions within their province. We don't have that. So whatever we do on our grid, we can't build too much and we can't use too much. We, we're in a very delicate in, environment here. We also do not have what we, we call good run of river projects. So you'll hear them talk about this. Uh, they, they've developed mostly, I think, run of river projects, which means they don't have, they have some probably uh, uh, ponding or, or they, they do have control structures and dams, but they don't have big reservoirs. Uh, the projects in the Yukon, because of our geography, we will have reservoirs if we build these projects that are bigger than 10 megawatts. Even some of our smaller projects could have reservoirs. Just because of the type of geography we have in the Yukon, we do not have the, the winter, um, we don't have the water, the rain, the, the, the melting snow that, say, British Columbia has that produces 
um, both the water flow and the, the height uh, that would enable us to have a good run of river that are over 10 megawatts. So these are some of the challenges that we face in the Yukon. So from that perspective, I still, what I'd like to do is if you can share some of your, um, some of your stories again about how you met, how you decided to take on a leadership role, number one, I think that's good. Like how did you and your First Nation decide to, to take charge and to proceed with a project? Especially when it must have been somewhat intimidating when there's all these major industry players that are standing, stepping up to do the same thing. Maybe Byron, you could start with that. When we began in, in 1987, we had already established a, a we had filed uh, with Ontario and Canada a notice of claim in which we were going to argue before the courts who actually owned, uh, owned the land. And, and I, I don't think that's completely dissimilar with some of the First Nations in the Yukon and in British Columbia uh, arguing Aboriginal title. Uh, of course, uh, it's, it's a long and lengthy process and, and it, since filing it in 2001, we expect to have our first day in court sometime, uh, sometime this fall. So coming from a position, a question of, of, of who owns the land, and, and, and really if we have a belief in, in, in the claim that we've filed, then we own the land. Um, and clearly, uh, looking at resource development, extractive development like mining, uh, uh, forestry, uh, and, and, and the development of hydro potential, we thought it was our place to be developing that potential within our traditional territory. I talked about some of the financial needs uh, about why we, uh, we did what we did, uh, but in terms of, of, of shaping how we look at development, looking at run of river, at small hydro, small hydro is not small hydro, it's not invisible hydro, there are definite impacts, but avoiding impoundment projects, the creation of, of, of large reservoirs, that was you know, a, a consultative process with our elders, with our community members, um, to look at shaping the philosophy of our, of our corporation, in which they said, we will not flood. Uh, we will not fragment uh, river ecosystems. We will not do the things that are typically, historically harmful um, uh, uh, to river systems. I'm not saying invisible, because there's no such thing as zero impact. Uh, clearly, if you have a paddler going down a river in which he's not used to seeing uh, development and all of a sudden there's a hydro project, there is in fact an impact. Uh, but that's a dialogue that we have with those particular user groups. So we have impacts. And our elders have said that our approach is, 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 is the proper approach. Um, our investment in terms of education uh, helps prepare us with respect to human capacity so we're not intimidated by multinational corporations that come and say that this is how things should be done. Um, you know, we're talking today about uh, a, a transmission project in which we're going to build a transmission line from Wawa, Ontario to Thunder Bay. It's a $600 million project. When I started my career 27 years ago, the first contract that the Chief and Council gave me was a $4,000 supply contract for firewood to Pakistan National Park. So, you know, as an order of magnitude, the projects that we look at uh, are much larger today. To look, be able to look at a $600 million uh, uh, transmission project in which we will own 20% just shows how far we've come. I disagree with the comment that the Yukon is, is, is different than other jurisdictions. I mean, when I flew here, I've never been to the Yukon before, but one of the things that has always impressed me with, with Canada is how large, I'm, I, I'm impressed with the size of the country. <clears throat> But the commonalities that run through our communities, regardless of whether you're Ontario, the Yukon, or in Vancouver. I mean, I landed, the first thing I saw was Tim Hortons and said, I'm not that far from home. How you approach your development, and, and I think there needs to be some caution exercised in terms of, of, of what the government does in terms of defining what a solution is and then attempting to impose that solution on the ratepayers of, of the Yukon how the government approaches it should be tempered with the fact that you have time. Uh, the, the problem, I think, was between 40 and 50 megawatts over the next 40 to 50, or 20, 20 to 50 years. You have a First Nation in Ontario that generates that amount of electricity uh, yearly. So it's not a large and insurmountable problem. The Yukon is a large territory. So that the solution that you end up with as ratepayers needs to be reflective of the values that, 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 that people from the Yukon uh, have in terms of, do you want to rely on renewable power? 
Are, are you willing to pay more as ratepayers for that as a source of electricity? Do you want to include First Nations in the benefits, the economic benefits of ownership? Do you want to, uh, uh, or, or is cost uh, the, the, the prime motive? And if that's the case, then build a natural gas plant and don't worry about the problem because it's, it's, it's not a large problem. I think the thing to remember though is that there's time. There's always time. Uh, and that the solution that, that ratepayers in the Yukon uh, arrive at need not be rushed into. Uh, no party should, be, should feel that, that a solution is, has, has been imposed, uh, particularly when there are other alternatives. Yukon, is, uh, with respect to the transmission uh, issue, the Yukon is isolated with respect to transmission because it chooses to be in isolated. You could build transmission infrastructure and connect yourself with British Columbia, with other jurisdictions, and, be, and put yourself in a position where you're able to import power. Is that, a, is that the best solution? I don't know. I mean, that's a decision that the ratepayers uh, of the territory have to make. But we're not as different as, as, as sometimes we think we are. And, 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 and there's time uh, to find a solution that works for everybody. Thank you. Mark, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, oh, first yeah. of all, though, with your First Nation, how many people are you? So our, our population on reserve is about 600. Uh, off reserve is about 500. We have about 1,100 members uh, throughout the territory. Yeah, so we'll get back at this, but I, I just, part of the question was, how, do, how did you guys decide to get into the power business? How did you get, how do you get motivated to, to be in that business? So it was a choice between casinos or power plants, and oh. we chose power plants. <laughs> it's the nature of the business. I mean, we wanted, uh, you know, it was the, first of all, the nature of the business. It, hydro projects typically last 100 years. So with a, an asset that has a life cycle of a century, and when, in particular, as a community looking for own source revenue, that's more predictable than casinos and hotels and tourism. Um, it, it, the industry itself just lent itself for investment opportunities from, from, from our First Nation. So the characteristics of, of owning and operating hydroelectric facilities uh, and selling power to ratepayers uh, almost seemed uh, obvious to us. Uh, it took, well, it's funny, it took us a hundred years to arrive at that solution because there are, high, there are hydro projects that date back that far in Ontario. But for us, I mean, in, in 1987, it, it seemed to me the obvious solution in terms of future investment, future focus. The question about what we did, I mean, in hydro projects are hydro projects. The real important question is what we do with the return back to the communities. And, and, and that's really the growth that we see. I've, I've had the pleasure certainly the privilege of, of living my entire life uh, on reserve. Uh, I grew up in a community that was powered by diesel generation. We had electricity 25% of the time in winter. And, and uh, it's cold up here, but it's equally cold in northwestern Ontario. So I know what the trials are in terms of, of, of living in a community that has unreliable uh, energy sources. Uh, you know, in Pick River, we had, we were the typical, the stereotypical First Nation. We had. 60 to 70 percent unemployment, a host of social problems, uh, lack of education, lack of human capacity, all of those things uh, that you see prevalent in or, or portrayed in the news as, as, as typical of, of First Nations. And uh, clearly something happened in Peck River in, in, in the 80s that changed that focus. It was an emphasis on th this idea that uh, we wouldn't rely on government transfers to find our way. We would invest in, in projects like, like hydro uh, to support our, our development elsewhere. And most importantly, the, an investment in, in terms of education and human capacity internally. Uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated about my career is that the returns back to the community. And I don't begrudge a corporation for making a return back to the shareholders. We all own pensions. Uh, hopefully we all own pensions. Our pensions are, 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 are invested, are vested into share, uh, shares and companies that are out there. So I hold, you know, I, I begrudge a corporation nothing for, for making profit. But you don't see a dividend back to a corporation as a shareholder. I mean, you really don't see it. But as a community member of the Pick River First Nation, to see our community transform from 60 to 70 percent unemployment to zero unemployment for the last 10 years. Uh, and to see, you know, the houses, the brand new houses, people with, with disposable income, people investing 
um, um, in, 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 their, in their families. Uh, I think it's something that I wouldn't have got to see if I was working for a corporation, but it's something I do get to see uh, as president of, of Pick River Energy. So. And Mark, uh, you talked about it today, um, how the First Nation that you work for got into the energy business and how it was built on existing, because in Quebec there was uh, relationships that already existed with the municipalities. Yeah. Well, at first I would say that about at the same time as Pick River, uh, in the 96, 97, the ban made an inventory of the uh, resources, potential hydropower sites uh, on this ancestral territory and uh, had the, then the opportunity to, to, to have a contract to sell the energy to Hydro-Quebec. And they built their first plant uh, in partnership, actually, with Hydro-Quebec as a, ma a minority shareholder. Uh, at that time, the, the industry was not so mature. Uh, conditions for financing were high rates, uh, a lot of um, uncertainty view by the, the lenders and so on. So you had the majority shareholder, but you didn't really, I would say, control your destiny or was not so good in terms of return. It did a, a return, but made, made a first step into getting into uh, independent power producer business. But at that time, for the same reason, I think, as uh, mentioned uh, by Baron, is uh, they were looking for certainty on a, uh, on a, a cash flow, predictable cash flow coming in in order to invest in other initiatives from the ban for education, uh, cultural support, or any other things that they, they, they had to do. And we're, they're still on the path today of increasing this um, cash flow that is not depending on the, the desire or the politics or the, uh, the, 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 the good thing to do at the moment. And, and so they are really taking control of, uh, of a, a, a good flow of revenue coming in they came up in 2007, in fact, at initiative from the band to communicate with municipalities around the band because where we're located, is, it's all developed around it. And um, so they, they, they brought people to work together. Two municipalities are actually almost fighting each other. Uh, so the element that made the, the glue in this was the, the band who made the call, made the meetings, put people to work together because they were tackling something that they thought was quite uh, uh, demanding in terms of an investment to go through the old development phase uh, without any, any partners. It was kind of too big in terms of advancing the money to, to bring the projects to be ready to build. So uh, at that, at even at that time, they were approached by uh, private developers of different companies and so on. But they, they, they really... Uh, uh, we're more inclined in getting partnership with municipalities where entities are a bit more comparable. And that was a decision that they made at that time, uh, which has been uh, one of the reasons for the success in this case, because Hydro-Quebec went out for a request for a proposal for power. And uh, the, uh, one of the elements in the evaluation to award projects was the involvement of the communities and communities at large, including the First Nation for sure, and when they've Idle Quebec, which didn't expect that really to, to receive proposal uh, of a partnership between First Nation and, and municipality. So they've really awarded these two projects that one is up and running today and uh, the other one will be under construction. So it's, uh, I think with all the same reason in a different uh, maybe way because a different of the environment uh, and they're looking for other projects in the future uh, we are in the contact with Idaho Quebec where they have t energy surplus. So for the government to defend the decision to provide or let the opportunity open up the opportunity for uh, power purchase agreement, they have to have a good uh, social sense behind it, so solid, sound uh, decision where they are, this is a mechanism basically they are putting in place to uh, help communities, remote communities, First Nation or uh, municipalities to uh, take over uh, some of their um, uh, development initiative and allowing them to, to open up on other initiatives that are not driven by a political decision, uh, some, some money that comes one time for this particular project so they really can 
now plan ahead of time with the uh, fluor revenues. So that's looking for the same, uh, with the same global objective, a different, little different path adapted to uh, the particular situation and location. Okay. I'm just wondering, Tracy um, and Jason, like, so Tracy in Saskatchewan, um, give us a, a sense of the type of projects First Nations are looking at there, because they're not all hydro, I would assume. Or are they, or what's, what are the type of projects that are being brought forward and discussed? Um, there's actually, we're looking at all of them. Um, flare gas, uh, CHP, wind, solar, hydro. Yeah, we look at all of them. And is the call, uh, like, what's the interest by the utility, I guess? Um, um, well, SAS Power, um, they have a long history. They're our crown corporation. They're legislated to provide power, reliable power to the province. And for really the last 100 years, they've been in the business of maintaining their um, infrastructure. And now, um, you know, when we do projections for the future, um, you know, the, the increase in population, the more demand for energy, um, there will be a gap in the next uh, 20 to 30 years. So um, now they're getting into an area where they're relatively new um, in actually having to develop power projects. Um, so, um, you know, a couple of years ago, if you mentioned solar power to SAS power, they would have been, no, they're not interested in that. But now we're seeing that, um, uh, and they're seeing, that um, you know, solar energy is a good option for um, different types of you know um, uh, different types of communities, or you know, depending on where they are. And um, one thing is, um, you know, not every uh, renewable source of energy is good for every community or every project. I mean, it's really every generation type is unique in um, that, um, you know, it's got to be the right place, right time, and, you know, things like that. So, um, and with wind, um, we have very little wind in the province right now, but um, SAS Power um, has been, you know, very uh, forthcoming on talking about developing a large wind uh, project in Saskatchewan. So, um, we're, we're making... Um, the steps are slowly um, turning in, in that direction, and we're quite optimistic that, um, uh, you know, they're looking at a, gener a good mix of generation types, not just relying on coal or one source, but really looking at it all and seeing where the best fit would be and, uh, and how to address the gap in the future for power. Thank you. Uh, Jason, you're raising capital for projects. What kind of projects are people coming to you to raise capital for? Yeah, well, it was, it's been interesting to hear about all the projects today, and I wanted to hear about how communities are actually moving ahead and finding ways to access the money to participate in the projects. Um, I know there's a number of uh, different projects. I know there's obviously, it's very controversial. You've heard of the, probably the gas pipelines that are proposed for British Columbia. Um, there's lots of First Nations that are trying to grapple with environmental impacts, and uh, but there's also other projects across the country. I know the you know one of the issue with the capital is whether or not you can actually get the money, but the other issue I think is the cost of it once you do get it, which may affect the ability of a First Nation to come to the table and, and participate. So I think you know having those tools in place, having that strong financial management system in place, being able to access the money so you can come to the table as an equal partner, which was fascinating to hear about the municipal partnership example, because I think if you're able to come as an equal partner with uh, the ability to participate, it just reduces the conflict that much that much more that you're an equal partner. So, um, you know, there's, um, it's, 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 I know one of the other things that we talked about too today is that, well, there seem to be opportunities emerging in different, different sectors. Uh, some are controversial, some are less controversial, like renewables, but regardless, um, the, when, if you're trying to get certified and get money when the opportunity is right in front of you, maybe that's too late, that you need to be preparing yourself for the, so that when the opportunity arrives, you actually have the ability to access 
the money and, and participate. So. so, so with the uh, First Nations, because you work with the, how many First Nations? The, the FMB has over a hundred First Nation clients across the country. Yeah, and some, uh, some, you know, not not remote in urban centers. Some certainly, I know, I think we have uh, some in, in very remote rural fly-in, fly-out communities that I never would have imagined that would be working towards these kinds of things. So it's certainly interesting to, to see communities now in Manitoba, in Ontario, in Quebec, starting to really work. And, and again, there was sort of certainly a stigma, I think, attached to the legislation when it was initially developed because one of the institutions is the First Nation Tax Commission. And a lot of communities, uh, that's, that's, those are bad words, talking about tax on reserve. Um, in BC, not so much. There's a lot of First Nations that were engaged in property tax for leasehold properties, commercial developments. But, um, you know, as, again, uh, originally it was, it was thought that these urban bands were gonna collect just tax revenue. But what the FNFA found out and the institutions found out with working with First Nations that, you know, we're actually collecting revenue from other sources. This is our technical term for other revenues. It's called other revenues. But there's actually a regulation that's been developed under the Act called the Other Revenues Regulation that specifies certain, certain revenues. It could be from an impact benefit agreement that a First Nation has for a resource project in its territory. It could be business revenue that it's generating from a business. And now those revenues are able to be taken and, and used um, you know, in their financial management system to be considered by the finance authority for a, a participation in the debenture. So that really has provided more flexibility. And I, th I think, it, again, the first bond issue happened last year in June. Um, it was for uh, $90 million. There was 14 First Nations that participated. Uh, there's been tremendous uh, growth and demand in access to the services of the three institutions in the regime. And we're expecting another bond issue this year. Certainly the FMB has seen a, a surge in demand for services and, and an interest. And um, so, it's, so it's interesting to see how uh, these communities are gonna, gonna be creative and find ways to, to use their various revenues and create infrastructure for their, their communities. Yeah. So, so we've talked so far a lot about investment, business partnerships, um, you know, how First Nations have approached this and moved forward. But obviously, within your communities and the communities you work with, the First Nation communities, um, uh, there's going to be a deep concern for the, what the impact to the water, the environment, uh, fish species and wildlife. How is it that in, the, in your communities, how are you dealing with um, the concern for the environment? Um, and the interest, I guess, or non-interest, I guess, depending on how that works with your communities and developing projects. How, how is that dealt with? Who wants to go I, first? I'll, you know, I'm, I'm going <laughs> off the board here a little bit, and I'm not gonna talk about the FMB if that's okay for yeah, one side. Ahead, but I'm a member of the Squamish Nation, and we have, a, we have a LNG facility proposed in our territory, right in the heart of our territory called the Wood Fiber LNG Facility, if you've heard of it. So it's, it's and, and of course, across the water from us, from our reserves in North Van is the Burnaby Mountain protests on the Kinder Morgan line, and so it's all very controversial. But what the Squamish Nation has done, which is interesting, I think, is said, yeah, there's an EA process that the province has, but we're actually doing our own. And so they've gone out and developed their own process uh, our, our legal advisors, our envi environmental advisors, working with membership, trying to, trying to establish our own approach to environmental assessment to determine what the impacts are. Clearly there's gonna be lots of impacts. I don't know what the results of that are gonna be, really it's underway, but it's, I find it just, uh, I know there's certainly obviously provincial approaches, federal approaches, and, and lots of studies I know uh, that have been done to figure out how can First Nations find their way to have input into these various processes which is, is another option. But uh, it's just, I think, worth noting that this is a community, my own community, that's decided to try and figure out a way to evaluate it on our own terms. So you're being pro yeah. proactive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, you yeah. talked about this earlier today, I think. Yeah, in our side, the, the, the most recent project, I mean, this, this uh, involvement of, commu of communities and citizens and people in general into development of any project has been, uh, uh, it's an in evolution. I mean, 20 years ago, people were build, building a plant, 
They were following the rule from the government, environmental studies, get the permit, get the thing done, that's it. Today, um, communities are more aware, more concerns. They have to be part and bound into the, the, the project development phase. So in the uh, most recent project that we, we actually won is in operation, like I mentioned before, and the, the other one has been following the same process. Even though the government defined the rules and there are public hearings defined at certain time once you finish the environmental impact study that has been uh, approved, not, not, not approved in terms of going to build it, but approved as in terms of quality responded to the terms of reference that the government gave you, then they said, okay, that's in compliance with what we request. We assume that it's okay. And then you have another pa process uh, to go to the public hearings. Uh, in, our, in our case, we looked at all that and uh, implemented a, a bit like you mentioned, a, a early on a process with workshop, with people from university who were taking notes at each of the different tables, with uh, f say ecological flow, aesthetical flow, uh, uh, impact on the park in the, in the case I, I mentioned. So we have all different subjects. So we put outline of the project. This is what we want to do, 16 to 10 to 16 megawatt project. It will look more or less like this. We put the powerhouse somewhere, put the dam somewhere, and then start people, oh, we have a concern because upstream where the, the dam is located, there's a vestige of a archeological site and this, so we move the dam 50 meters upstream. Then we look at the powerhouse, we put it along the, the old building. They said it's too close to the old building. We moved it out. It was an area, it's kind of interesting, this one, because uh, during the course of the development, uh, the corporation who are operating the park had a, a, a place where with stairs and a terrace to look at the waterfall. And the first thing they told me when we came in to just starting about the layout of the project, they were saying, you can do whatever you want to do here, but you can't touch this. But and guess what? After all the process with the communications with the people and the involvement of the people, we end up in putting the powerhouse right where they said they didn't want it in the first place. But you were buying it. It's, it's just to show that when you involve all those people and they, do a pro they take a proactive role and really the interest of um, helping and contributing and putting to the, on the table their concerns and you, you let the talk go and, and explore avenues and show open, open mind about ideas, you come up with something that it's different than what you thought in the first place, even though I, I, I believe that in the first place we had a pretty good thing. It was just, it's a pretty good thing. The dam was at the wrong spot. The powerhouse was at the wrong spot. <laughs> so, but, but I'm very glad that we went through that process. And, uh, and we have a, a very good result with uh, even the first impression we have the, the architect doing um, specific features around the building. We received the proposal, we said, whoa, <laughs> because at first we were thinking about, okay, we're gonna do something uh, with the same uh, uh, architectures similar to the old building, but it was just an engineer idea. The architect had something completely out, out of that box and really got everyone to buy in. And now the powerhouse is basically a terrace where you can walk around and it's all interpretation with specific point of view on the waterfall with different angles and so on. So it was completely out of what anyone else around the table at the beginning would have thought of. Well, there was a result of really the contribution of each other, of all the, the, the people involved. So basically, once you understand the, 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 the global goal, then all the fine tuning of it, let's let people get involved and put their concern on the table and really make a good um, assessment or, and the best shot at it. And then you go back with what you have got, their comments, you work for three months, you came back with these ideas, hope we fine tuning this, that, that, and we're getting there. It's like building a house. So the first layout you put on the table is not the best one. You, you need to let, let it go and digest it a little bit and come back and argue and get to the finish line. You can't get 100% of the people buying in, but you got a, a good chunk, much over than the majority buying in. That, that's where the, the, uh, that's the end result of it, yeah.
So being proactive, and I think I understood today what you said is you did all that before you even pitched the pitch the project to the utility, right? Like uh, this even was all in, the, in, the, uh, the, in Quebec, we have the environmental process. You receive the terms of reference from the government saying you have to study this, study that. And, and during that process, you all obviously need to define the project itself. So all this uh, communications and, and integration of comments from the, from the people in the area uh, was done along that project definition and was a very honest um, and open process. I have to see process again, but it's the, and organized. We had the, a firm specialized in communications, so we were all there. Like the, the developer was there, the people were there with all equal around the table. We put something because you can't, you have to start with something, see what the concerns are and what the elements of the projects are. But as soon as it comes out, then you, you get the, okay, they have a concern so, about so, this, concern about that. So what I'm trying to say is, then it went through environmental assessment after that. So yeah. this is just all pre-work to get the concept. Then when they were selected to build the project, then they still have to go through the regular process of assessment. So you just get an idea of the work that went into it, the proactive yes. work. I, I, I mean? look at it as, as, as an additional step. Uh, the fact that our, our shareholder is, is, is a First Nation does not exempt our company from having to consult with ourselves, and that seems a bit odd, but uh, I, 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 you know, consulting with the community, with the elders, uh, and with the community at large shapes, first of all, I talked about shaping our, our investment philosophy, but as well helps define the projects that we actually build. Um, you know, the whole purpose of consultation uh, is to identify impact. And the purpose of identifying impact is, is to attempt to arrive at accommodations that work for First Nations and work for developers. But if you don't engage in that primary step of, of consultation, you'll never know the scope of impact of your activities within that territory. So you know, we have a, in Pick River, uh, the community has its own consultation and accommodation law in which all of the developers, uh, mining, forestry, uh, anybody within our territory has to follow. Uh, in addition, we have to follow that same consultation uh, and accommodation law. I think that these projects um, are value laden. When you make a decision to develop a hydro project, you are forever changing the characteristics uh, of that river. Um, you know, where a paddler would go before where there was no hydro project, uh, it will forever change it. And I've been on both sides of the debate. I, 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 I've I've been to the Federal Court of Appeals, uh, uh, fighting canoeists, fighting naturalists who have, have maintained that, that what we're doing uh, represents a destruction of the environment. But I've always maintained it's really a values decision that our community has made to, to develop those resources within our territory. Uh, and that happens through this, this consultation and accommodation law. We know what the impact is going to be. We're aware of that. Uh, but for the other reasons that motivate us, uh, we decide to proceed with, with the development, uh, with those developments.